today's scripture is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 56, but I'm going to read from 46 to 57. So, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with them about three months and returned to her home. And this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. Let's go ahead and thank the Carter family again. Thank you all. Yeah, you can. No, I'll take it. All right. I, uh, I forgot to mention earlier a couple things. Uh, Y'all here in the first, like, four rows on uh, this side over, great work. Every week, that's your seat, okay? We're filling up. We're moving up closer. Uh, we still have this side is empty. I don't know what's going on there. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll try not to lean away from that, from you all over here. Cause, but also, I want to wanna point out, I forgot to mention that um, why we're dressed up, right? Y'all might be like, Dave, this isn't normal here, <laughs> you know, Um yeah, it's uh, in, in an effort to up our game, up my game, right? We have two pastors who came here around this time last year. And they're like, all right, Dave, you got you to gotta up your game um, and dress a little better. No, we intentionally wanted to just help us again to enter into this Advent season to rem- remember the significance that this isn't just like any other day. And, 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 and there's kind of a both and always. It's like, we can come before God as we are, raw, in our pajamas, our sweats, right, our hair all messy, whatever it is. Um, he invites us. It's because of his grace, his kindness that draws us. And yet we also uh, at times remember the, the significance and the holiness of God who, who is so gracious and generous and inviting to us. So um, that's why maybe some people in g- general dress up uh, every week, right, for, for worship and why um, others don't. And, uh, and why some of us uh, sometimes of year do and sometimes of year don't. So even there's some kind of some significance behind those things. Um, so again, I want to explain it to you. Also, it's been cold the last few weeks. So, right, the, the coat helps. Uh, will you go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 1? We're going to be in Luke together. Um, if you don't have a Bible, will you hold your hand up high and keep it up? Uh, we want to, not so we can look laugh at you. <laughs> Right, but so we can give you one. And uh, we want to make sure you have a copy of God's word that you can keep and follow along with. Um, y en español, si quiere la Biblia y no tiene, por favor, levante su mano y diga español. Y si no tiene una Biblia, um, esto es un regalo a usted. Y esta mañana estamos en um, Lucas capítulo 1. So, um, again, uh, this is a gift to you. Okay, if you don't own a Bible, please keep this, and uh, we want to make sure that you can read it and uh, submit to uh, God through his word and, and ultimately be shaped and transformed as an individual, and that's what we're doing now together. So um, again, corporately, collectively, we, we come under his word. So to that end, let, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we, we come, as, as Pastor Marcus prayed at the beginning, as uh, Jared and Trish just shared during the Advent um, time, as they lit the candle and talked about hope, um, we are a fickle people, and we live in a fickle world. We trick ourselves from time to time when everything's just right. Last night, when for one of the first years ever, the lights that I hung up actually turned on, and uh, the first try, and I have a sense of accomplishment, and uh, I can forget that I am so not in control and uh lord that we don't know what tomorrow holds but but we know that you are the same yesterday today and forever and that though the flowers grow and fade 
uh, your word is here to stay. It, it, it never changes. It is, again, the rock upon which we stand. And so, Lord Jesus, as we come before you and we learn about you, the solid rock, uh, we pray that by your spirit whom you've sent, you open our eyes. Lord, I don't know where everyone is at this morning, but those of us who perhaps are hardened in some way, maybe it feels safer to keep a wall up, I pray that you will lovingly and yet firmly um, break our walls down so that we can receive the healing word of Christ. In his name we pray, amen. This, uh, this right here goes out to the underdogs. So I sing a song for the hustlers trading at the bus stop. Single mothers waiting on a check to come. Young teachers, student doctors. Right, I know we have some of both of those in here. Sons on the front line knowing they don't get to run. This goes out to the underdog. Keep on keeping at what you love. You'll find that someday, soon enough, you will rise up, rise up. Yeah. Okay. Some of you didn't know it. That's a Louisa Keys, an incredible song. Some of you are going to have that stuck in your head. The whole sermon, it could, could be worse. Right? I love that song. Um, not just because of, of Lisa Keys. You can't help but move and groove uh, when she's singing and she's poetic and, and wise. And it's a great song. But also, um, I, I love underdogs. It's probably not hard to figure out why, right? Like short guy, stutter, like cards are stacked against me, or at least I like to think that, right? Proverbial underdog in life. Um, I love, in fact, I've been accused of switching who I cheer for during a game, depending on who's winning, right? If I don't, definitely yesterday that wasn't the case. I was cheering the whole time. The last uh, couple years I've been cheering for the same underdog every game, week in and week out. But we love them, right? We got one in the win column. But uh, I do, I love underdogs. Like, the Cleveland Browns right now, I love them, but if they keep winning, I'll probably stop and I'll pick a new team. But uh, I, I, some of us, I think most of us love underdogs, right? We all love our own team, but underdogs are just something that, that, that we naturally, most of us will, will cheer for. And it's, um, you know, truth be told, I think innately, we, we understand that, that we try to trick ourselves, like even said earlier, we try to remind ourselves that we're constantly trying to climb out of this role of underdogs, but we are all um, helpless before God. And as we look at this first week in our Advent series, we look at an underdog. We look at Mary. And uh, some different cultures, different faith traditions do different things with Mary. Some um, maybe elevate her perhaps too highly and, and forget that her significance and importance is because of who God is and what God chose to do in her and through her. Uh, many of us, I think from our kind of evangelical Protestant tradition, maybe don't look pointedly enough at the significance of Mary. We don't recognize just how incredible God's work in her and through her uh, was. So we get to look at Mary and underdog on every Level. So how we're going to go about this this morning and, and throughout the weeks ahead is we're not going to try to get too creative. We're going to we'll look through what might seem like very fam familiar stories, very familiar passages to many of us. If Even if you didn't grow up in church, you watched Charlie Brown, right? Maybe you heard L L L L the great theologian L L Aquinas. Right, is like he always, uh, right, he talks about this story, he recites it, he's an evangelist, carrying a blanket, sucking his thumb. And, um, and he, so we've, we've heard some of this stuff before, but hopefully with fresh eyes we get a glimpse at, again, God doing a significant thing at an unlikely time through an unlikely person in an unlikely way. Uh, the great playwright William Shakespeare said, some people achieve greatness, uh, some people are born great, some people have greatness thrust upon them. And that's Mary. She 
is a really normal person, again, in many ways an underdog, through whom God chose to do remarkable things. So with that, will you look with me at Luke chapter 1? We're going to start in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. So a couple things, right? We'll learn down in, in verse 34 as well here that, that um, Mary um, is a v- v- virgin. She was a v- v- virgin. She'd never had sex with a man. And then down in verse 34, we see that all throughout her pregnancy, um, our theological understanding and truth is that she, she, uh, she never had sex um, until um, after she gave birth to Jesus and was, 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 was married, was wed to Joseph, her, her husband. And then they had children, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, being one of his, uh, his siblings, his half-siblings. Okay, so... So again, just some of us kind of wonder, what do we do about, what do we make sense of this? Well, that that, uh, until uh, this moment here, and then all throughout her pregnancy with Jesus, Mary uh, never slept with with a man. Another thing, though, we might miss here is she's betrothed to Joseph. So let me be clear here, in this culture, in this day, if you're betrothed to somebody, you don't, like, shoot a text to break up. You know, it's not you, it's me, uh, it's it's not working out. You know, um, you know. Well, let's be, be friends. I'll c- catch you at the mall sometime. We'll we'll bump into each other. Um, do, do young people go to malls anymore? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Back in my day, <laughs> right? Malls is where it was at. But um, you know, that's not how it worked. In order to break up a betrothal, it, you had to go through a legal process. So you can't, though we'll find out elsewhere and other times that Joseph wanted to honor her. He had planned on breaking up with her, breaking this betrothal, but it was really hard to keep a secret. It wasn't just an easy thing to do here. So the fact that she's betrothed is a big deal. And, and, and so she's, she's, she's young. She's never had sex before. And she finds herself right here um, now told that she's going to give birth. And, and, and in verse 28, this, the angel, right, speaks to her. And what does he say? Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And then down in verse 29, essentially Mary says, who, who me? <laughs> I think you're talking to the wrong p- person. On, for multiple r- reasons, right? First of all, she's never slept with a man. How can she be pregnant? But even deeper than that, perhaps something that we all relate with, her view of herself is very different than what's being told, what God is saying is true of her. She's she's poor. She's a young woman. And especially now with this news that she's somehow pregnant and she's betrothed and she's very aware that she's likely going to no longer be betrothed. And even worse in this culture, in this context, um, many women were at worst, killed, sometimes at best just kind of ostracized and cast out for this kind of thing. And, and she's, she's afraid, and she doesn't feel favored. But, but let me say this, what, what God speaks over us is truer than what we think about ourselves. Okay, as we consider Mary in this season, right, many of us, again, these holidays, different Different days, we feel a different thing, whether it's a good hair day, a bad hair day, certain mirrors. Like, I love the mirrors at, in the Target dressing room. Somehow, I'm tall and thin and, you know, I don't know, gray hair doesn't even show up in the mirror. I don't know. And then other mirrors, right, you walk by, like, a car window, and it's like, ooh, like, what is that? Who just, who was that? You know, and we are, again, we're so fickle. But what God, the truth that God speaks over us is sh- shapes us, is grounding. We can, we can build Upon that, and so here's Mary, a regular woman from a really low station in life, 
through whom God chose to do incredible things. That, that's his MO. That's his ways. All throughout the scripture, God loves for his strength to be known through our weakness. That, that's his, in, in everything in our culture, and in some church cultures even, we like to push against that, right? We like to, to think that, that the, the most polished person, the most, you know, the, the, the best, you know, the best, uh, the best, I don't know, coffee, whatever it is, like that's, that's where it's at. And, and so often we see that God's theme is, is that he likes to show his strength or weakness. Now that doesn't mean we go out of our way and, foster, you know, kind of foster some kind of false humility or things like that. But, but without even trying, we are weak. And God loves to show his power through us. So continue on with me as we look at God working through Mary. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of this kingdom, there will be no end. So again, we just read that. We hear Linus quoting it or referring to it in, you know, Charlie Brown's great Christmas tree or whatever it's called, the great pumpkin. I don't know, I just merged some things there. But either way, right, fo focus on the right things with me. Um, he's, right, he, he we, we get lost in all this and we miss some things. Well, what? is happening here, and Luke, the author, intentionally puts in there that the angel reminds her this isn't new, as Trish so greatly shared with us. God um, does not, does not like, as the shadows change, he remains the same. He's not like, oh, plan B, Rome all of a sudden happened. You know, I don't know what's happened. Like, you know, our, my people are floundering. They're now many enslaved. Oh, new, you know, curveball. He's not reactive. No, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this angel here quotes 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. And, and this whole section there in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is this is a, like a thousand years before Jesus would come. And this is what God told to his servant, David, right before he was going to die. Is it up here? He says, When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, like not to take a nap, that means you die. I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. If you know some of that story, not long after David died, his next son, Solomon, who he probably thought he's talking about, he walks away from the Lord ultimately. And then his next son leads to what becomes a divided kingdom. And then both kingdoms get overtaken and enslaved. And God's people are constantly under the thumb of other nations. And it would be so tempting, again, for over a thousand years to think, God is not a God who holds his promises. But in an unlikely way, at an unlikely time, speaking to an unlikely person, he says, no, no, no. Through you is going to come the one who will be the fulfillment of my promise. And even before this, there were promises that God's people often thought were going to come a certain way, but didn't. So again, over a thousand years before, we see God is a God of his promise. And then again in verse 34, right, Mary's confused. She says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? I've never lay with a man, right? There's a question there. This, this can't happen. I can't have a baby. So how is this forever kingdom going to come about through me? Like what you're saying can't be true. Again, like right, we want to get caught up there in the biology, but can you relate with that? How, God? How? According to what I know, there's no possible way. But God answers. 
He says in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Jesus will be conceived by the Spirit. Can in an unlikely way, no one could have, though now looking back, we look at the scriptures and we see so clearly God's plan revealed. But as is often the case even now with us, right? And I just want to give us a, a hopefully a sense of, of theological humility. Okay, we are a church that has strong, firm theological convictions that we stand on, that we build on, that we have, we talk about in our membership. There is so much that we can take to the bank that we believe is, is true, and we know this. But some, I'll just go kind of off script here for a moment. And by the way, um, I forgot to set my timer, so I have no idea where I'm at here um, time-wise. Uh, you're welcome. No, I got a clock. I just didn't know how many times. Um, you know, Megan, I didn't mean you to call me out there and put me in Megan check. Um, so, no, thank you. You got my back. Right, in our, in our membership packet, at the end, there are three things that we hold open-handedly that we talk about. And we talk about um, spe the specific details of creation, the specific manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and the specific details of the end. The end time, the final day when Jesus will come and restore all things. There are very specific things in each of those that we stand firmly on, that we believe the Bible, the scriptures are abundantly clear on. And some people, and again, I might be kicking a hornet's nest right now that I didn't plan on doing, but that's okay. Um, because we, we want to focus on the, the main thing. We know that according to Matthew 24, according to Revelation 7, according to Revelation 21, like we know the end is coming. We know that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord and that, and that God has raised him from the dead and that he is Lord of lords and King of kings, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, and that he is making all things new. I don't know if someone just cut my mic off. Um, right, that he is, he is in control, and we know these things, and we stand firmly on these things, but the exact details of them, we need to come with a posture of humility. And, 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 it's, and it's not because we want to be fickle, right, because we want to go the, the tides of culture. And instead, it's actually the exact opposite. We want to stand firmly on the things that God has made known to us before Jesus came, though you and I read and look at Isaiah chapter 53, and we see so clearly there the, 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 the hints, the promises of what God would do in sending his son Jesus to suffer and to die on our behalf. It, it, the, his servant David didn't know. Isaiah, the one, the prophet who shared that, others who came after didn't know all the exact details. But we can learn from them and know that God is a God of his word and his promises will be secured forever. So coming back to verses 34 and 35, no one before this would have known that God in his infinite eternal wisdom would send his son to be born like every human being on the face of the earth, every image bearer, every sinful, wandering, broken image bearer of God is born of a woman. There's no other way. Born of a woman. So Jesus came, born of a woman, fully human, like you and me. And yet, verse 35 conceived by the Holy Spirit, fully human and fully God. What a great God we serve. Right? We can take that for granted. But looking back, let us be informed as we also look ahead to God always fulfilling his promises, but often in unlikely ways, at unlikely times, through unlikely People. And then he tells, there's more to the story. He tells, this angel tells Mary about her cousin who's walked with infertility. Like my own family, like many of us in here, for many years she got to an age where she thought, oh, that day has passed. 
But this angel now tells Mary, actually, your cousin, Elizabeth, is pregnant. And, right, he didn't text her yet. She didn't post it on Facebook, right, Instagram. She didn't know yet, but this angel tells her. So Mary runs to go share her own good news and to go in and rejoice with her cousin, Elizabeth, right? So she runs, and then pick up with me now in verse 39 through 45. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Okay, so a couple details here to po- point out. One is um, that, that, that this, is, this is John the Baptist's family. Okay, we, we were in John, right, for a number of months. The book of John, the gospel of John, we looked at John the Baptist, uh, Jesus' cousin, who, second cousin, who, who baptized him. Well, well, that's his family here. So that's who we're, who we're talking about. And there's, there's relationship there. And, and, there's, and, there's, and, there's, and there's miracle at work. And, and, and right, Elizabeth says that, that, that she's blown away. She feels unworthy to be a recipient of this good news, right? In verse 43, she says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How many of you have been greeted like that by your family? Right? How many, who in here showed up to the door on Thanksgiving and your parent, your older, your sibling said like, why has God's favor been bestowed upon me so much that I am visited by my younger brother? Right? As a younger brother, I can tell you I have never heard those words and never plan to, right? Even as an even as a forty plus year old, uh we still got into some older brother, younger brother squabbles <laughs> over Thanksgiving. It never never goes away. Um right, but something's going on here, right? Is these are these are cousins, right? These are like I've smelled your breath before. I've seen you with food in your teeth before. I've gone to the bathroom after you before. Like, right, we we don't keep it buttoned up here, right? This is who stays after Thanksgiving dinner's over and everyone leaves. You unbutton your top button or other buttons and, right, you're relaxing. You're sitting around. You're watching TV. You're like, this is family. But something we say here a, a lot, life is naturally supernatural. This is a person, a look, Elizabeth and Mary would have lived a lot of natural, everyday life together. But God is doing something supernatural, and it's acknowledged, right? In some of our redemption communities, when we give God stories, when we share what God is doing in our lives, it's often a time of recognizing everyday, seemingly mundane, normal life, God stepped in. He's doing something supernatural through our seemingly natural, everyday comings and goings. And then something I also just, I, I, I have to point out here, and I want to point out here, in verse 44, right, we see that the baby leapt for joy. We see here the significance of the sanctity of human life. A baby rejoicing, feeling, emotions, in this case, worship. Okay, first we need to look at the significance of life in our culture and our day. And hopefully you know, right, we're all going to be uncomfortable or take comfort in knowing we're going to be uncomfortable together. We hammer on the significance of loving the m- marginalized and the, the immigrant, and which, which we'll see in further on in the story and incredible things. And here we see in God's word the significance of, of the sanctity of life. We also see the significance of this baby recognizing, unable to to withhold 
his proximity to Jesus, God's provision, the fulfillment of God's promise. This baby leapt for joy. It, parents, can we learn from our children sometime? That was a clue for the mother. Say, something's going on here. Not just, oh, I'm the mother, I'm the protector, I'm the provider, I have nothing to learn. No, the baby in her womb leapt for joy. And then she, in turn, said, I'm so blessed. I, I get to be visited by the mother of my Lord. And then, finally, in this section here, in verse 40, I think 45. And blessed is she who believed that these would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. In the interaction with the angel, Mary wanted to question. Mary had all kinds of real good answers, right? Ah, uh, you're saying I'm going to give birth. I've never slept with a man before. That's impossible. But then uh, your older cousin who's been unable to have children biologically for years and years, is also pregnant. Mary believed God's word. Even when it didn't make sense, she ran. Together they are worshiping. And her cousin says, good on you for trusting, for believing. Even when it doesn't make sense, God is a God who fulfills his promises. And as we read earlier, in chapter 1, verses 46 through 56, Mary does what just makes sense, right? She sings. She busts out in song. I'm going to, I can't withhold it, and she gives what's known as the Magnificat. That's the Latin word for the first word of this is magnify, right? Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Church, as we close, let us not worship Mary, but revere Mary. An unlikely person through whom God chose to do miraculous things. Let us take our cue from her here. Let's respond together in recognizing that God does great things. That he always fulfills his promises, that he will never fail us. Mary is a significant character because she points ahead to the main character, God, bringing about the arrival of the fulfillment of his promises, Jesus, born at an unlikely time and an unlikely way to an unlikely person. So let's respond together as we do every week in prayer and singing, right, like Mary, in worship, in communion, in giving, acknowledging that nothing is impossible with God. So we can join in saying, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you are good. Because you are good, we can call you Father. You sent your son, Jesus, to be born of a woman, to be born of a virgin, so that he could be born of God, fully man and fully God. Lord, let us focus on Jesus. Let us worship Jesus. Let us also learn from his mother. Let us learn from her humility, her faithfulness, her courage, her trust, her imperfection, and yet her faith in you. Thank you for constantly doing your perfect work in unlikely ways through imperfect people. In Jesus' perfect name we pray. Amen.